Okay, let's get started. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the serverless panel. Uh, there's been a lot of action in serverless uh, in the past few years, and here you have representatives for, from many of the serverless projects that run, uh, that are portable and that run on uh, container platforms. Uh, and so we have uh, Anthony from Galactic Fog, uh, Yaron uh, from uh, Nucleo, Chad from FN, uh, Michael from OpenWhisk, uh, Alex uh, from OpenFast, uh, and Edith Levin from uh, Solo.io who's doing Blue. Uh, each of them will have two minutes to uh, present their, uh, their project uh, with slides. Uh, and uh, I'll run a timer, so I'll just cut you off after two minutes, so be fast. <laughs> All right, uh, Anthony, you're first. All right. And you can click if you want, and it's already live on there. Ah, okay. Yeah, That's yeah. even better then. You guys hear me? All right. Um, so uh, our platform is called Gestalt. Uh, it's part of a bigger platform that does both container management, API, but pretty much any kind of enterprise cloud-native management that you could uh, expect. Uh, Laser is our function as a service implementation. It stands for Lambda Application Server. Um, we're a hybrid platform, so we run inside of Kubernetes. We run in things like DCOS. Um, it's pretty flexible. You can bend it to work just about anything. Uh, we have really broad language support, so pretty much any kind of programming language you can, you can imagine. If we don't have one, you can customize one of ours um, in a day and add a new language. Uh, we support all the advanced kind of features, so everything from a metrics API. Uh, we're very low latency. Um, we do cold, warm, hot scheduling. We do streaming lambdas, so uh, we can take Kafka feeds, run functions on them, and, uh, and output that to another stream. Uh, it's, it's pluggable. We plan to add a lot of other executors in the next, uh, next little bit. Um, and there's a bunch of enterprise features, like distributed log search, so that developers can see you know, the outputs of their function, how things are performing. You can have a policy engine that can control what developers can do in dev, QA, and prod. Uh, and it's, it's got a nice um, configuration manager uh, built in. Uh, this is just kind of the architecture. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's too much to show here. Um, you know, the, the scheduling allows us to have uh, performance that's really close to cloud native or to, to traditional application performance, and we can tune for exactly that. Uh, one of the clever things about our model is we can support something called hyper executors, which are language runtimes that can uh, actually run multiple threads in a, in, um, or multiple workers. Uh, and so, with that kind of model, we can get you right back to batch or traditional performance. Um, and we often use that when we're processing like Kafka feeds and other things so that um, we can process millions of messages a second and uh, handle it in a stream. Uh, and we use that for pipelining and other things when, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a future release we'll have support for like workflows and a bunch of other things where we'll be able to pipeline multiple different languages into the same model and have good, good performance. I think that's it on yeah, time. We Perfect. are done. Wow. Very good. Yaron? Yeah, so yeah, uh, uh, yeah, the green one. Four times. Yeah. <laughs> I put these extra slides in there. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, actually, it's uh, Chad first oh. with a fan. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Good. Uh, all right. Hi. Now my start. name is yeah. Chad Arimir. I'm VP <laughs> of Serverless at Oracle. Uh, I lead the serverless group, and one of the main projects we're working on is called the FN Project, which is an open source compute platform. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm a 3X entrepreneur, most recently founding CEO of a company by the name of Iron.io. I joined Oracle about a year ago. I put blame us at least partially for the term serverless, so uh, sorry for that. Um, we started talking about serverless computing back in 2011. There were some earlier references to function or FAS, which was frameworks as a service in 2006, uh, but you know we didn't had no idea it was going to become this whole category of computing. Now it's actually pretty cool to see. So about FN, um, we're an independent, 100% open source functions as a service platform. You can run this thing on any cloud or your own cloud or your own hardware. Um, we will be one of the only major cloud providers to also have a, a production service based on a 100% open source project that anybody can take off the shelf and run on their own. Um, we make containers the primitives, so anything that can be inside of a container is your function. This is really powerful because a lot of times you'll go to a site and it'll say, here's how you get all of our dependencies to work, like try to get FFmpeg or something to work and by just zipping it up. Well, at the very bottom it says, well, just try Docker, and that can now be your function, so it's pretty powerful. Um, we have an act very active uh, team of over 30 people working on the project and the service, over 3,500 commits and, and lots of contributors, uh, native cloud event support, which I'm sure we'll talk about today, and also uh, declarative and language-based workflows. I'll talk for a second about that. 30 seconds. Architecture is very simple. 
we have, uh, it's pretty simple, we've got an FNLB at the top that routes traffic. It ensures that hot functions continue to stay warm and will continue to route to the appropriate container so that you can get very fast response times. If uh, a container becomes busy, it sends back pressure and says, we're busy, and it'll start to spin out more hot functions to ensure that you can keep it performant. Um, and then, of course, you need data, storage, MQ, object store, and a container registry. You can use any container registry if you want to operate this on your own, Docker Hub, et cetera. Finally, F and Flow are really cool workflows. Maybe we'll talk about that. Thank you. All right, Yaron, you're next. Okay. Uh, good. So I'm I'm Yaron. I'm CTO for a company called Iguazi, which is building a real-time analytics platform that can be deployed in the cloud and, and the edge. Uh, we also developed Nucleo and open sourced it about a year ago. Uh, rapid, uh, rapidly being adopted and getting a nice GitHub start. It's a one platform for serverless that can be deployed anywhere on your laptop, on your VS Code, on any cloud provider, and on-prem. We also have a managed offering around it, fully enterprise, security, LDAP, authentication, everything. I don't think there are many uh, of those. Uh, for the cloud provider, we've done native integration into each cloud provider, so it can actually show you logs in the native logs of the cloud provider, native registries, uh, Etc. and other contributors, including Microsoft, have done work on that project. Uh, what's unique about Nucleo, it actually started as a back-end processing engine for data and not as a front-end. We didn't even have HTTP in the beginning, uh, so that's why it's focused on a lot of performance and data processing, uh, which is a bit different. Uh, Nucleo has parallel processing and real-time processing engines, so it can essentially do in Go up to 400,000 events per second, in Python or other languages, 50, 60,000 events per second. That's faster than you running your own function on a bare metal server. Uh, it also has other unique features around real-time distribution of shards, uh, batch processing, and other things with dynamic uh, work around that, support for all the different streaming and message queuing solutions in the market, and has uh, persistency features for volume, databases, and context cache, which are used extensively by our data services. It's fully managed, you have UIs, everything is open source. You have UIs, full managed marketplace, you have monitoring facilities, RESTful APIs with security and authentication. Uh, you have VS Code plugins, structure logging, debugging. All those features are built in, so it's a real enterprise grade solution. Okay. Give you 10 seconds. Pretty good. <laughs> So um, talking about Apache OpenWhisk, um, we initially developed this with an IBM research. We didn't uh, start this as uh, something which was intended to be a product in itself. We first wanted to explore um, the market and the out of the possible. Then we launched the open source project um, publicly in February 2016. We launched um, a service, cloud, also OpenWhisk, back then on Bluemix. We transitioned the, the open source project to Apache end of 2016, together with Adobe, Red Hat joined then later on, and a number of other partners joined as well. Um, we are running this in a way that containers match the rate of events or requests coming in. So um, there is always um, in one, one container running for each request or event. Uh, we, are, we are running this in a synchronous and asynchronous way. Uh, up to um, the, the invoking entity. Um, we have an API gateway out of the box. Um, this is all hardened as part of our cloud function service, which is exactly based on the open source code base that we are offering. Um, a few words about the, the concepts. We have the, the concept of a so-called trigger, um, which represents an event source. We can hook that up via a rule with an action or a function. Um, the action then can be um, written in essentially any language. We have a number of languages that are performance optimized, like Node, server-side Swift, Java, Python, and PHP. Um, but like, like some of the other projects, we, all, we give you a catch-all approach where you can just say, here is a Docker container, and run whatever is in the Docker container for me. Right. OK. So Alex, let me uh, put your slides. Uh, All right. Remote. Uh. Yeah. Can you go to full screen mode in the app? It's the the third icon. Oh. Not the red one. The the third icon. Oh, like that. Screen. Yeah. 
Let All me right. just see if this works from here. Okay, yeah. great. So whenever you're ready. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you about OpenFAS, and you may have already heard of it. I'll talk about why it's been so successful. We have three core values that drive everything we do in the project. We develop a first, which means we're building something for you guys here to use. We have a CLI, we have a UI, we have all the tooling you'd expect, and integrations into the cloud native ecosphere. This is operator friendly. We find that early adopters really work well with this because they know exactly how to run it. And they don't have to take a lot of dependencies on things like Kafka or Cassandra DB, but if they need those, they can manage them themselves later on. And this is a community-centric project. I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. So the main benefits of OpenFAS really align well with, with what Docker's trying to do. You can run this anywhere. But most of all, we're trying to make this easy to use. And that goes back to our values. The key difference between OpenFAS and a cloud platform is that you can take the guardrails and set them where you want. Right? You decide what the limits are for your functions. The architecture is Kubernetes native. Actually, if we look up here, you see an ingress or load balancer. Could be anything you like, like Kong or Glue. Speak to an API gateway, and we have a CRD controller that will create functions for you as pods. And just like OpenWhisk, we have one ready all the time that's warm for access. Then we built into that Prometheus, so you have monitoring out the box, and that's streaming for asynchronous processing. We find this is a simple stack that is easy to understand, easy to install with Helm, and people can get their job done. Now, this is the community that's helped me build this. I started this, and you may have seen me at DockerCon last year in May, and it's really just become um, a product of the community. We'll also talk a little bit about GitOps. Hopefully, we'll get a chance for this now that we just run out of time. Um, and I think this is where serverless needs to go now. We've built these platforms. We now need to focus on the integration, push code, get endpoints. All right. Thank you. OK. Um... Okay. Hi. Okay. So yeah. So my yep. name is Edith Levine, and I'm the founder and the CEO of Solo.io. Uh, what we're doing in Solo is a little bit. Let's see. If, what is my slide? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I know where my slide is. Uh, so basically, the idea with uh, Solo is we're really, really passionate about serverless. We think that is potentially be the future. But we also need to be careful about what's going on today in the ecosystem. What's going on today in the ecosystem is that there is still quite a lot of monolithic application, and actually, even if most of the enterprise is trying to move to the uh, microservices architecture, and serverless will be the next step. So what we basically want to do, and I don't know how much time I have, and what is my slide? Um, oh, yeah. So we have a few options. Yeah. So I mean, I'm actually going to stay with this. So basically what we're trying to do is to glue the environment together. We're basically focusing the migration story. In order to do that, what we choose is we basically, I don't know, we'll show you that soon. We, cutting everything to function. And if we're cutting everything to function, we can actually then migrate easily and also create something that I call hybrid app, which is basically a group of different functions for monolithic, for microservice, and for serverless. Am I out of time? Oh, no, I have time. OK, so continue talking. <laughs> uh, so, so we are supporting, we build on top of Envoy. And uh, we basically letting you the ability to extend your, your application from monolithic to microservice and serverless, and then migrate it simple by simple, function by function, from the monolithic to the microservice and serverless. We are supporting, I think, almost every platform that you will see here. So we're a big supporter of those, and also all the public cloud like AWS and, uh, and, um, and uh, Google and Azure. And probably I'm out of time, right? I know, I do have still time. No. Okay, so let me continue talking. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I will talk in the keynote later, so I will maybe keep some stuff for the keynote. But as I said, the idea is the migration story, how we bring in those amazing projects to the real world, which is still monolithic and microservices. Good. Thanks, Edith. Great. Thank you, everybody, for <laughs> keeping in the time limits. I, I, I wasn't sure we would be able to do that. <laughs> 
So let, let's go with the first question in the panel, which is about the, um, the serverless ecosystem and community. Uh, so portable serverless frameworks, like o o all of your projects, are quite new still. Uh, what do you think uh, are the main features and innovation that developers need uh, in order to solve uh, uh, the, the problem that they have? Uh, what are easy developer workflows, debuggability, observability, function composition? Like uh, uh, among all of these, what, what do you think is, is the priority there? Do you have any tips or recommendations, uh, gotchas that you want to share with the audience about how to uh, uh, deploy these technologies? Uh, what are the pros and cons of the public cloud uh, proprietary serverless uh, offerings uh, compared to the ones that you represent, which are all portable? Uh, and what's the future and evolution in a, in a, in a, in a couple of years? And that's just the first question. <laughs> then after that, I have 50 other questions for you. So uh, wh one of you wants to get started on that? <laughs> That you want yeah, to <laughs> yeah. So the f the first one is about the the features. Like, uh, what what do people need in terms of serverless? Uh, uh, to start. Why people really yeah. want to explore any of those any of those uh, yeah. platforms right. versus the cloud offerings? You know, I sit in panels and people are bitching about this serverless sucks because it's only 50 megabytes and it's only five minutes and all sorts of restrictions that are very opinionated by the cloud provider. And I think uh, us uh, having uh, platforms which are more flexible are bringing it to a new level where you can customize things. You're not limited to 50 megabytes. You're not limited to five minutes of runtime. You can suddenly do persistency and many other things that weren't designed into those uh, cloud solutions. Even if you go today to Amazon, the best databases are not the ones that were created by Amazon or by the other provider. So it's open for other uh, players. I would just say that uh, you know every every year for the last three or four years has been like a different focus. Uh, you know, one year everyone's focused on how they get like schedulers to do cold, hot, warm, so things are fast. Uh, then they're focused on how they get them uh, deployed and integrated with like API gateways and security. Streams was like the big thing. You know, I guess the last year uh, or so. Um, so being able to do stream processing, uh, you know. I think that that continues to move forward. I think we're getting to the point though now where there's enough adoption that um, probably to Alex's point, the uh, the big thing is is to start focusing on how do you just build everything with function as a service and what are like the good operational paradigms um, and getting people to realize that you know like you can really just jump past containers and just go right into function as a service for for a lot of companies and that's a, that's a better fit for what they're trying to achieve anyway. So can I? Am I am I on? Hi. Um. So. That last slide that I showed you, if I can get you to remember back to that, there was this idea of um, functions. And we've all built these great platforms, and they have their pros and cons and different use cases. I know Doc is doing some work to evaluate them and compare them. Um, but that's not all there is. Once you have that runtime, and we all have a Golang runtime and a, and a Python and a PHP runtime, whatever it may be, they may largely be equivalent. I think what's going to separate them is when we see these second order projects rise up and help developers accelerate their workflows. So I have some of my, my colleagues from VMware here. Thanks for supporting me. Basically, we had a meeting with a, a large forward-thinking bank. And one of the things they said to us is, infrastructure is cheap, but development hours and Silicon Valley salaries are really expensive. And so if there's anything we can do, to make it easier for developers to ship code into production faster, we can save a lot of money. And I think we need to move, and perhaps in this group, we've moved beyond that argument of per second billing. But for, for us, we can save much more money. Like Yaron said, we can expand the limit of a image. So one of our users, um, Anisha Kashavan from the University of Seattle, is doing machine learning with medical imaging. So she needs to have very big base images before she even starts. She uses Anaconda as a base image and then adds her work on top of it. Now that you just couldn't do in the public cloud. You'd have to use a managed service, but then you're locked into that. So you get this portability. Now I, I think I understand from having tried to operate a similar environment to what these guys are doing, that you need those guardrails, and there's no way Amazon could have their cold start of eight seconds or whatever it is with a, a one gig image. So there's reasons for it. But as a business user, as a consumer, 
you're probably not Amazon and you don't need to run a global scale product. You just need to enable your developers to ship code. Yeah, what, what I think is also going to happen is that those initial restrictions like the 300 seconds everybody's talking about or the 50 megabytes that you mentioned, I think they will go away over the next year or two. Um, that people, I mean, it, it happens all the time that new technology comes out, it, it imposes certain restrictions um, to have a low barrier of entry, but over time people realize you need more like the example you just gave. And when, when people are building then more complex applications consisting out of dozens, hundreds of functions, they will need new tracing capabilities, new monitoring capabilities, and, and that's then where also the differentiation is going to take place, I guess. I think that if you're looking right now at the, the past of the history of why actually serverless exists, so we remember that they, the, the reason AWS has announced it is for two reasons. The first one, is financial, it's really, really cheap, right? You basically run, pay only for what you're running. It's make a lot of sense in the cloud, public cloud. The second thing is basically to glue their services, right? They're public cloud, they have a lot of service and they wanted to glue that. So what I think that will be very interesting to see is in a, how it's going to play in the on-prem, when maybe the services are different and the gluing is less make relevant. And in terms of, you know, the, 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 you're not paying per se for uh, services and you will need to actually, you know, go very fast on this. So, I mean, I mean, I think this is, will be a challenge that you guys will need to solve and I cannot wait. Uh, yeah, and I think a lot of areas of innovation are needed in both ecosystem and tooling. So, so two of the areas that I think are most important right now is to focus, for our groups to focus on what the tooling looks like around operations and DevOps because I was at a DevOps conference, conference and I did a lot of research for a talk I did there and it's not that DevOps is changing, it's just that DevOps has barely got their head around what microservices means to their operations and how they're changing their culture to embrace microservices and now we're starting to talk about containers and we're just getting containers worked into our CI CD workflows. Now you're talking about serverless where you suddenly break down the monolith into thousands of functions what we really need to do is focus on the tooling and the ecosystem to help provide scaffolding to be able to manage this, be able to operate these things over time and in the enterprise, to be able to, be able to bring this to real world use cases. Because what it looks like today is triggers in the cloud. You put an object in a, into a bucket, it triggers a function, you do something, a new server spins up in the cloud, it, it triggers a function that you can uh, apply security policy or tagging, and those are really nice, those are great tasks, but those aren't full-blown applications. That's not gonna get our legacy applications into better architectures. So I think there's some real key innovation that we're all thinking about up here when it comes to CICD de deploy and, and tooling. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of architecture, uh, now let's talk about the architecture of each of your frameworks. Uh, what's unique about your project? Uh, and then uh, uh, how, how does it differentiate from the other ones based on that uh, architecture difference? Um, I guess I'll go first. Uh, ours is based on Aka Stream, so it scales really well. It can handle stream processing really well. Um, we have a bunch of different models that are bundled in. Uh, so that, you know, um, like we can run multiple lambdas inside the same container at the same time. Uh, that helps with like scaling and performance. Uh, ours is built on top of our container abstraction layer. So you can run ours on, again, on things outside of Kubernetes and it can be adapted to different pieces. Um, otherwise, I think most of the other kind of core capabilities, everyone else is kind of bundling in. So. Yeah, so uh, we started Nucleo as a, something internal for our own platform. So we're using it, we're eating our own dog food. So we had to develop a lot of instrumentation, for example, structure logging, debugging uh, into it. The second is because it's designed for real-time analytic use cases, we've designed it extremely fast. So a lot of uh, parallelism uh, built into it. So this combination of on one end, uh, a lot of focus on data processing and performance. On the, on the other end, a lot of uh, focus on operational uh, aspects, security, monitoring, debugging, et cetera. Yeah, well, so we're working really hard on bringing serverless to the enterprise. Obviously, Oracle has a very large install base when it comes to enterprise customers. And so they're looking at us to provide some leadership in what serverless looks like to their organization. So we're focused really heavily around things like security and performance, uh, operations, being able to operate this thing. We'll, we'll be a major cloud provider to offer a service based off up, upstream open source. Um, so these are a lot of the differentiations. We're working on uh, 
more language-based workflows, so you don't have like long reams of JSON to do workflow, because uh, I don't think any human should really be reading or writing JSON. Um, we believe those should be described in more language-based primitives. Like, for example, Java, we took um, completable futures from Java 8. We, we provide a nice interface to do single programs that can fan out to thousands of functions behind the scenes. So these are a lot of the things that we're working on to make it better for more complex applications in the enterprise. Yeah, um, our focus has been um, a lot on performance optimization. So you get the model like Lambda, for example, offers it, but on an on-premise infrastructure, and we, we, we proved it out as part of running our own service. We have um, lots of experience in terms of where Docker breaks or where Docker broke in the past um, when you stressed it in dimensions that it wasn't used to be use, using, like parallel container creation, pausing, unpausing, those kinds of things. Um, and we have an architecture that allows you, similar to, to what was just said, um, to create compositions of functions on top of that. Another angle, we, we talked about the limitations in terms of footprint, uh, 50 megabytes being a limit and so forth. Um, the architecture we have is, allows you to basically have any size of, of image, but still have a good performance in combination with it. Okay. Great. So you saw the architectural diagram for OpenVAS there, and if you're familiar with Kubernetes, that should have made sense for you. And that's what we want to get to, that's the message, is that this shouldn't, this shouldn't take you a day, you shouldn't have to be trawling documentation to understand how to install it and start shipping functions. So Docker is a key component here, and that's because of the portability. Now I was a, I was a Docker captain over a year ago, and I designed open FAS or FAS at the time as a way of kind of breaking free from these restrictions and being able to have the portability aspect. And so it targeted Swarm. And then around a year ago, I switched to also support Kubernetes because I designed it with a pluggable architecture. That meant that other people built other backends for Mesos and Nomad. And we even have someone in the community that's building a backend for ECS and Fargate. And so what that means is that whatever platform you're targeting, you get the same UI, CLI, function store and workflow, and you can change the back end. So we're focusing on being cloud native, being, I think some of you may have seen the cloud native definition 1.0 came out, if you haven't, look it up, the CNCF. Loosely coupled components working together. And with OpenFAS, we do not want to reinvent a load balancer, reinvent an image builder and whatever else it is. We'd like to use what is already in the ecosystem and to, to borrow your name, glue it together Right. Yeah, so uh, with Glue, as I said, we are not a fast, so it's a little bit different. But what we are trying to do is basically um, give you the experience for the developer and for the invocation exactly like you did with the monolithic with microservices and serverless, which means we're using Envoy in order to get you all the great grid of the Envoy proxy in terms of security, in terms of uh, you know, DLS or whatever else you need, canary deployment, everything that mature and we already like about the, you know, the, the Kubernetes that, um, that exists there, bring it to the serverless. So if it's you know, security and logging and everything that exists there, um, um, and yeah, that's, that's basically it. And as I said, I'm going to talk later, so I'm giving you the stage. Cool. Uh, recently, my colleagues, uh, Jules, who's sitting there, I think he connected with uh, each of you. Uh, he started doing a benchmark uh, of, your, of the different frameworks. Uh, and the, the reason uh, he started working on that is that many of our customers who install Docker EE with Kubernetes uh, they, they are super interested into starting with one of these frameworks and they ask us which one is the best uh, for, uh, and so which one is the best, our, our, our question then is uh, for what? Because uh, there are lots of different dimensions in evaluating a framework. One of these dimensions is performance, so we'd like to be able to uh, uh, show them a performance benchmark. What we think is that the best place for that benchmark is in the CNCF uh, serverless working group where I think, I think each of you is working. Uh, so we'll probably uh, uh, send that to the working group uh, to start collaborating with everybody there. Uh, do, you, do each of you have uh, some point of view of what you'd like to see in a, in a benchmark? Yeah, so um, one, of, one of the things I did in my, um, in my past was to work at ADP scaling to 500,000 clients. We had a dedicated team that measured performance with each release. And 
I don't, I don't want to sound too critical, but whenever I see someone turn up and say they've done performance testing, they tend to do it on their laptop in a VM, virtualized with Siege, and they say, oh, it broke. I'm like, yeah. You, let me tell you about performance testing. And that's what I think we need to be careful about here, is that we design a test that's scientific. We're only changing one thing that is fair and representative. And so when I spoke with uh, my team at VMware that have done a lot of kernel and systems performance analysis, they said, really, you shouldn't be testing a no-op. You test a no-op, you're just testing the CNI network driver and um, kubeDNS. And when pushed hard enough, kubeDNS will start to fail. Um, and we're looking at core DNS to replace that. So I think we need to agree on a medium-sized use case something that's heavyweight CPU and heavyweight memory so that we can have a representative and not um, inflated benchmark. Right? And that needs to be run on Kubernetes and not on localhost or loopback. And I, I think doing it the way you're starting is, is the right way to go. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's even more like complexities, right? So when you look at some of the other serverless frameworks, sometimes people actually build images with the code baked in. Um, and, and sometimes they don't. Like some of us have, you know, frameworks that just snatch the code into what you're doing. Um, so even that can be a basic thing. Like, did you start with that or not? Uh, you know, similarly, um, you know, one of the questions is like, you know, would you test it with a streaming workload? Um, and if you're going to test it with a streaming workload, then maybe ordering matters. So maybe like, you know, you send in a million messages in order, and we want to see a million messages come out in exactly the same order, um, because you might be scaling, but if things are out of order, that doesn't work for use cases. So it can be quite complex to compare apples to apples. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's probably the problem that we're dealing with here is it's not apples to apples. All these frameworks have different tuning options and different you know, capabilities. Um, but I think we could probably come up with a couple of just good use cases. And I wouldn't aim for the middle. Uh, I would do extreme use cases as well as the middle, just so you can see you know, what shines with people that have things that are built for like heavy grade you know, enterprise you know, levels of, of data. Yeah, so I have a lot of years in benchmarking. I come from performance background, and I don't think that we'll, we'll do one benchmark. Take YCSB, it's 13 different tests. So we do need, on one end, an extreme yes on Kubernetes, et cetera, but maybe uh, no op to show the maximum uh, footprint of a serverless framework, lowest latency, et cetera, without showing that you know, image processing takes, a, takes an hour, so this extra millisecond doesn't, doesn't count. Uh, on the other end, we do need image processing. We do need scaling of uh, streams. Most platforms here don't, don't really support scaling of streams, so obviously uh, that benchmark will apply to some and will not apply to others. So we do need to come with a full envelope. I made my proposals in, in CNCF for that of different tests. <laughs> some frameworks may shine on some, some others on others, and the user will decide based on user's case which one is the best fit. Great. Yeah, on, on our side, on, on the Docker side, we really want to see that effort getting started because our customers are asking for it. Uh, the last question, because we have uh, six, minutes, uh, six minutes left, and I, I wanted to have a, a little bit of time for the audience to ask you one question, is what kind of use cases have you seen uh, of your uh, framework? And uh, are there any enterprise use cases in there? So I, I guess think, <laughs> yeah. uh, most of ours are all enterprise. Like we're an enterprise company, and we we, we mostly focus on heavily regulated uh, companies. Um, uh, I mean, there's always the glue code solutions where you're just uh, you know merging microservices together and doing clever things. I think that's very common. Uh, and, and auditing and logging matter a lot in there. Um, there's also a use case that we see where we take streams of data, we run a function on it, and then we create an output stream um, or a substream. And then quite often, like that goes to a different app, and then that app turns around and does the exact same thing with a completely different use case. Like maybe you're filtering the data and cleaning up garbage, and then the next part of the, you know, the next downstream system does the exact same thing, but they're doing AI analytics or other pieces. And we see like banking and insurance companies uh, with, with those use cases. So we're, we're also very focused on enterprise customers or sort of tier one enterprise customers using Nucleo today. Uh, main focus of our platform is, is real-time analytics, so this is where you'll uh, You'll see that. What's uh, interesting in our platform, the only way to program things are through Nucleo. That forces us to do things like persistent storage and other uh, things that usually serverless doesn't do. Uh, main use cases we have like uh, cybersecurity analytics for largest telcos, uh, ride hailing customers using it to do uh, fraud aggregations, all, all that stuff. IoT manufacturing, uh, together with the joint solutions we had with Azure for IoT Edge, uh, across the board, many solutions. 
Yeah, we're, we're, <coughs> we're seeing our customers start to jump in where they really want to see things like um, helping them streamline their DevOps activities. So again, I mentioned earlier, when new instance fires up, ensure it has like the pro proper security profiling applied to it, make sure it has the right tagging applied to it, make sure it, you can essentially track all of your different infrastructure, all your different components to certain groups, um, being able to tag functions themselves, so functions that do DevOps across other functions, is really, it's really interesting. Um, but we advise our customers to start simple, not try and boil the ocean, not try and, and migrate some huge application over to a serverless architecture, but um, places where you can start with simple use cases that are these sort of triggers in the cloud use cases, then move on to something more complex. But there's a lot of interest in a lot of different areas, because at the end of the day, it's Docker, it's just code, anything you can run inside that container can become your function, so it's really powerful. Uh, the, the set of use cases we are seeing as part of IBM Cloud Functions is is um, relatively broad and it also, also goes across industries. So there is nothing really nailed down to a single industry. It, it also goes along the spectrum of single person startup up to multi-billion dollar enterprise. Um, the use cases we are seeing are um, REST backends. It's a very common use case. Um, data in flight processing coming th in through uh, by, by Kafka, for example. Data address processing that is getting stored. Um, mobile backends, we are seeing that quite, quite often. Um, IoT is a very common case. Um, chatbot logic um, is coming up. And, and also increasingly massively parallel um, operations for doing computer or, or data processing. All right, Alex? Yeah, so again, we've had a, a range of use cases. And actually, it's been great being at DockerCon because I sat at the back of a session about to walk out and someone said, are you Alex? I'm from AT&T, and we're using OpenVAS in production for ETL. I want to show you this cool project that I've built on top of it. And what I loved about that was that OpenVAS is an open platform, and he was able to build his solution around it without having the solution forced upon him. And I think that's really one of the things that we see people love. Now, the other thing is, um, at BT Research, Joost Noppen is one of four DevOps guys, it's an early inf early adopter and influencer, he has to support 140 engineers. And so he wanted to know how could he enable them to take all of their different experiments in different languages and have them built as functions and then scaled up and, and tested. Right. And so he started to build a pipeline and we noticed this pattern of other people doing that. And that's where OpenFAS Cloud comes in. It gives you this GitOps experience that Weebox has been pop popularizing. You push code and get endpoints. And I think that's really what's going to help accelerate this, is we need to start thinking about how can we make this developer workflow better? We have these patterns now. Um, and to some extent, you may see a similar experience with a zip file or a text editor in Lambda. But this is Git-centric, and you're getting a Docker image. So we're taking the learnings from the industry, and we're applying them. You did? Uh, for us, as I said, the main use case is migration. So what I see is a lot of enterprise customers reaching out to us and basically are interested to move to microservice, but also to serverless. Uh, Sometimes they're actually skipping the, the microservice and going all the way to the serverless. Um, is that one thing that I see? The other thing is that we specifically, we're going to announce some uh, open source project today in the keynote, and we actually need serverless function there. So <laughs> I would love to talk to you guys because we actually have a cool idea to integrate that and we will need some of your help. Great. So, yeah. We have uh, one more minute, so uh, we'll take one question. Uh, th there's a mic over there. Just come up to the mic or I'll bring it to you if you're not brave enough. Winner, winner. So uh, I was interested in some point of view on automated testing because I think all of you have brought up CI pipelines and DevOps point of view on this, but I think particularly with serverless and chaining together a bunch of very small functions, um, some sense or confidence that the whole system works um, can be a little bit difficult to, at least we've struggled with that with some of our Lambda. Yeah. That, that, could be, that could be challenging. How do you test any distributed system? I think that one of the only ways you can do that is through integration tests. But within OpenFAS, whenever you do FAS CLI build, the template will run unit tests if you've provided them. And I think we really need to think about functions as almost like, how can we formally verify that this is doing what it was meant to do with some samples? And then the extra stuff is actually 
quite challenging at the moment. How do you get a reliable S3 and a, a DynamoDB equivalent on-premise in exactly the same configuration as in the cloud? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, that's a good conclusion. Uh, I think our time is out. Uh, the panelists may, may stay five minutes outside uh, after this talk and edit. You need to run for your keynote. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.